About uh, 10 years ago, at the American Society of Hematology, I organized a symposium, and the title of the symposium, Emergence of New Anticoagulant Drugs, Will Heparin, Aspirin, and Warfarin Survive? So, consistent with this and with the objective assessment of newer drugs that we had for the past several years, the inclusion of this topic of low molecular weight heparin was very fair, and I want to thank Greg and Sam to include it. So I'm just going to give you a very quick short update in this area, but I want to say that heparins will remain with us, for most of us, for our lifetime, both low molecular weight heparins, unfactorated heparin, and heparin derivatives. So the uh, Drug heparin is over 75 years old, and the low molecular weight are heparins with us for about 35 years. We have some developments in low molecular weight heparins in expanded indications, which I'll go through. But we had some very exciting development in ultra low molecular weight heparins, which somehow in the eyes of the regulators were not up to date or not as elegant, so the drug is, is questioned again, and I'll go through that. And then we are very happy to have Dr. Walenga, who developed the pentasacride many years ago, and this drug is getting an expanded uh, indication in many different countries. So, heparin, of course, this is the original heparin drug, discovered by a medical student, 1917. With that, we had the low molecular weight heparin and ultra low molecular weight heparin, and the knowledge of the structure of these gave us the pentasaccharide on the perinox. And this was the structure uh, sequence of the heparin, which led us to understand the binding of this molecule to antithrombin, and then strong amplification of the anti 10 and 2A activity. So based on this structure, we have several synthetic analogs developed. So the commercially available uh, low molecular weight heparins in this country are three. This is daltiparin, enoxaparin, and tenzaparin. Enoxaparin is the most widely used low molecular weight heparin with several indications, both in arterial and venous thrombosis. And I don't have to tell this audience of those indications, along with some of the newer publications in which these drugs are used. The genetic version of this drug, enoxaparin, or one of the low molecular weight heparins, have recently become available. Now, many years ago, there was a big debate about are all the low molecular weight heparins the same? And this group at NATF, even before the inception of NATF, always proposed and contended that each low molecular weight heparin should be a distinct drug. And I'm very happy to have Dr. Tellerico in the audience who also supported this view. And we now have each low molecular weight heparin, tenzaparin, enoxaparin, and others classified by the FDA as distinct drugs and thus specific indications based on the clinical trials are uh, given for these drugs. So the chemical properties of make each low molecular weight heparin unique. There are biological differences in their structure. And of course, we'll hear Dr. Levy and see that many of the anti-inflammatory effects of these oligosaccharides are also quite important. They are not totally explored. And then we have pharmacological differences this then translates into the differential clinical safety and efficacy of these agents. Many years ago, we also proposed that when you depolymerize heparin, there are microchemical changes. These are damage inflicted on the structure. And these structural modifications, which were artifacts of depolymerization, now are considered by various people to be attributes, but they, don't, don't, they do not have any 
uh, pharmacophore properties, but each low molecular weight heparin can be characterized depending upon how it is manufactured from the standpoint of its structure because we now have the technology available. So, in addition to the low molecular weight heparins, there was a surge of preparing ultra low molecular weight heparin which had lower molecular weight, have lower anti-2A activity and higher anti-2A activity. One such drug was developed in Europe and is still marketed there for specific indications in cancer. The other drug, which have been quite strongly developed in all over the world, Semilaprin, and was recently reviewed by the oncology division of the FDA. Unfortunately, the FDA did not approve this drug, but the drug is very interesting because it has much lesser low molecular weight heparin, better safety index from the bleeding or heparin induced homocytopenia standpoint, and yet it is not approved because of certain questions about the trial design and so forth. It's being considered in Europe for the same indication at the present time. And both of these low molecular weight heparins are ultra low molecular weight heparin, much lesser and heparin induced from cytopenic ability or much longer half life. So both have been tested for several indications including cancer associated thrombosis and in various medical and uh, surgical thrombotic complications. The low molecular weight happens in cancer have been tested in several clinical trials. Cancer associated venous thrombosis is widely observed. Two years ago, Dr. Goldhaber and Kessler organized a symposium on this issue at the ASH where we have reviewed this. And heparin and low molecular weight heparins have been used in cancer associated thrombosis, uh, although only one low molecular weight heparin has been approved for this indication. Daltiparin is that heparin, is approved by FDA for the prevention of DVT in cancer patients. Other low molecular weight heparins, enoxaparin, tenzaparin, have been used for the management of VT in cancer patients as well. Now the expanded indications for low molecular weight heparins, although not approved by the FDA, are classified in the next few um, bullet points. Autoimmune disease associated thrombosis, pregnancy associated thrombosis, and here I would like to make one comment that despite the very important findings about these newer low, mo low molecular weight synthetic agents, the oral anti 10A2A, we cannot use these agents in pregnancy because they all cross placental barrier. Sepsis associated coagulopathy, pediatric thrombosis and molecular thrombophilias and also in cerebrovascular thrombosis, these low molecular weight heparins have potential to be used and of course the initial validation of these drugs was carried out in hemodialysis. Now, we were fortunate to work with this French team where Dr. Valega, along with Dr. Choi, Maurice Petitou, and Dr. Lagmo characterized the structure, the structural sequence in heparin which binds to antithrombin and then synthesized the pentasaccharide which now we have as Erextra or Fondopernox. So pentasaccharide is totally synthetic heparin derivative it is free of biological contaminants and does not generate heparin-induced thrombocytopenia associated antibodies. And it has many of the pleiotropic attributes which heparin has, including signal transduction properties and the thelial release of certain substances and so forth. And it is not fully explored from the standpoint of its polypharmacological effects. The current status of pentasaccharide is that it's used for the post-orthopedic surgical prevention of thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. And it's different from low molecular weight heparin because there are no viral contamination, uh, free of contaminants, other contaminants, not usually associated with HIT and is safely administered to patients with HIT. The additional developments in the pentasaccharide area were methylated pentasaccharides which Dr. Goldhaber and myself worked, and biotinylated 
pentasaccharide, which could be neutralized by certain agents, but its development was also stopped for some reasons. And these derivatives are still quite interesting, yet we are not proceeding with their clinical validation in their trials because of the newer anticoagulants which we are dealing with now. So the most interesting development in the area of low molecular weight heparin has been the introduction of generic versions of low molecular weight heparins. And this, of course, has been a great debate for the past several years where NATF also took a position. The generic versions of low molecular weight heparin in this country are only introduced for two years, but they have been available in different parts of the world for almost 10 years. So we now have in the United States a product generic version of anoxaparin from Sandoz, one from Amphistar marketed by Watson, and then we have an authorized generic from Winthrop. So in July 2010, the US FDA first approved the Sandoz's low molecular weight heparin. There are some 10 other companies which are in the lineup to have their generic product approved. And these are some of the products which are available in the US and in South American countries. The generic uh, low molecular weight heparins, some of them are very, very similar to the uh, innovative product that is Lovnox, but there are certain differences in other products. Because of the biological source, that is the porcine mucosa, heterogeneous composition, uh, and the effect of the manufacturing processes, there is a high potential for variation in these low molecular weight heparins. Product co quality, identity, especially when there are multiple manufacturers, purity, and then we have seen the adulteration. I'll discuss this in this afternoon. Poor manufacturing process and batch to batch consistency. So these are some of the concerns which were addressed. The NATF position on generic look, generic products has always been consistent is to promote affordable generic products to all needing these drugs. However, patient safety and product efficacy are the critical concerns and must not be compromised. Patient safety and product efficacy must be demonstrated in valid phase three clinical trial design for specific indications. And approval guidelines must ensure that any biosimilar drug or biogenetic drug and its reference innovator product be interchangeable for each intended usage based upon scientific and clinical data. And the appropriate guidelines for biosimilars should be developed. We still have a debate and we still are concerned about the quality of some of these products and the Europeans have not approved a single generic product at this time. However, the good news is that despite the introduction of the drug, Sandoz's drug, we do not have any major safety issues so far reported. The new oral anticoagulant drugs, of course, are quite exciting, and I've been working with these drugs for almost 40 years. The new oral anticoagulants, Debigatran, Pradaxa, Revoroxaban are approved for various indications as we saw from the eloquent presentations, especially by Dr. Goldhaber. Dabigatran is only approved for stroke prevention, whereas Rivaroxaban is for the stroke prevention as well as the post-orthopedic surgical indications. Both Xeralto and Enoxaparin, that means that the Rivaroxaban are effective in the management of post-orthopedic surgical thrombosis. Long-term management of both surgical VTE may be advantages with the newer oral anticoagulant, especially in patients with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia because some of these oral anticoagulants, 10A and 2A, do not have that potential. And our group is taking a lead in this area and doing some studies. So the last two minutes, I'd like to bring to your notice that even though we are all scared of bovine heparin, 
which has been used for many years for open heart surgery, as long as I know this, but it was withdrawn. But bovine heparin is coming back because the pegs are not meeting the supply and demand. So bovine heparin is used in South America and some of the development countries. North American countries are practically free of BSC and other viral contaminants. And with the current technology, the viral contaminants can be removed effectively. Therefore, safer bovine and low molecular weight heparins can be developed, and that is being done in South America at this time. So, in summary, in the U.S., only the following three low molecular weight heparins are available, enoxaparin, daltiparin, and tenzaparin. In Europe and other countries, there are some 12 other branded products. Enoxaparin is the most widely used drug. The two generic versions of enoxaparin, Sandoz and Watson, and one authorized generic from Winthrop is also available in the United States. The safety and efficacy of generic products are reportedly uh, comparable, and cost effectiveness is, of course, almost the same. There's not a big difference in the cost, unlike other generic products. A new low molecular weight heparin, ultra low molecular weight heparin is available in Europe. There is bemiprin, especially for cancer. And then the FDA did not approve the ultra low molecular weight heparin semiloprin. However, this product may come back for other indications. Fondaparinox is widely available for the prophylaxis of DVT and other indications. Of course, it's also used off label by cardiologists. It has a better safety profile than low molecular weight heparins. Low molecular weight heparins will remain the standard of care for multiple indications. Enoxaparin, branded, and generic versions will be the most commonly used parental agents, will remain to be, and the low molecular weight heparin may be more cost effective and widely affordable due to the availability of the generic products in future to come. So, with improved technology, more stringent regulation and control mechanisms by FDA, the quality of heparin and low molecular weight heparin has greatly improved and will continue to be improved. Safer, more effective heparins will be continually introduced. Low molecular weight heparins will remain to be the drug of choice for DVT management for years to come. I'm happy that we have additional drugs which can be used beside the low molecular weight heparin for DVT management. But I think heparin, which has been used for such a long time, is still unparalleled for surgical anticoagulation, and low molecular weight heparin will remain with us for years to come. Thank you very much.